Hi everybody. In this video I'll be talking about Mongo and MapReduce. Really I'll be focusing more on MapReduce than Mongo and we could do MapReduce in Cassandra using something called Hadoop. Hadoop is, you may have heard of it, it's fairly famous. It's an Apache project that's really a framework that's designed for doing distributed processing of large data sets. So how can you write a program that'll run on a multiple data or on multiple machines in a cluster that'll work with these large data sets? But the reason I'm switching to Mongo is I just think it's a little, even though Hadoop is fairly famous, I think it's just a little bit easier to understand MapReduce if we approach it from the Mongo perspective. All right, so let's get started with Mongo. Um, there is instructions on Mongo uh, and Cloud9 at the Cloud9 site. Let me just bring that up. Here are those commands. So we're going to create a uh, directory that holds the data for Mongo. We're going to create kind of a local um, script shortcut for actually this is how we're starting Mongo, but we're going to just be able to say MongoD here and then change the permissions on MongoD so we can execute it. So let me go ahead and do these. Let me just rip this tab off. And let me get that echo command. And let me change those permissions. Okay, and now I'm going to start Mongo and I'll just do it this way. So there is a script that this echo command created. There's that MongoD script. And if I look at what's inside it, you'll see that it's whatever I echoed into it. So it's nothing fancy, nothing behind the scenes here. It looks fairly straightforward. Okay, now I'm running the Mongo server. And in order to connect to it, I need to um, get a new terminal here. So it's not like Postgres, which is running this as a service. I'm executing it right in this terminal. And uh, before I go into the client, let me get some sample data. This is the sample data that Mongo provides in their kind of getting started um, section. And that I just got a file locally here data set JSON. Whoop. That's not the way to do it. Oh, excuse me. All right, that actually is a little better. All right, and now let me import that um, into a, I'll create a database called uh, test. Nothing very exciting here. I'll, this collection is Mongo's um, way of this of it's the equivalent of a table so it's really a collection of documents rather than a table has these ideas of columns and rows collection is just this collection of documents but it's sort of roughly equivalent to a table in Postgres and let me call that restaurants and if it exists I'll drop it okay I think that's good all right, and that looks reasonable. So let me go into the client, and that command is just mongo. And I can look at the what databases there are by just saying show DBSs. So I have not very many. I have that test uh, d database that I created. And let me use that test directory. And now I can show collections, the equivalent of those tables and we see that I have the restaurant one. So let me just take a look at uh, one of those entries. So this is, would be the equivalent of just a select statement where I don't have any of the where clause. So it's kind of select from restaurants, the equivalent of. So that syntax is DB. And next is the name of this collection. Again, the equivalent of a table. So in our case, it's restaurants. And then what I want to do, so the kind of the equivalent of select, I could just say find here, which would find all of them. So select splat from restaurants. But let me just do one here. So I'll just say find one. So I have that entry here. This is called a document. And we have this name of the, so you see it's kind of a key, it's a JSON uh, key value representation. 
I have the name of a restaurant here. I have more information about it, what borough it's in, what cuisine it's in, and so on. So let me see if I can do uh, find um, the equivalent of a select with a where clause. So let me do DB. So this, that's roughly the syntax with what I want to search for within these braces. Let's say I want to find something in the borough of Manhattan. And I find something within the borough of Manhattan, this uh, Irish place called DJ Reynolds Pub and Restaurant. Now, uh, we see in this document that it uh, has some embedded information. So here we have a key whose value is this bit here. And inside that, this the thing I'm calling this bit is another key called zip code. So we could search for something kind of in that embedded. So it's in this address mode, the zip code within address. So let me just show you that. So it was address, and then zip code within that. And then the zip code 10075. So I found an entry, or an entry, a document whose zip code is 10075. So that's how you get that embedded to find, to do a search on something that's kind of embedded. And let me just show you an and right quick. I don't know why I do this method, but I do. So cuisine is, and let's stick with that address zip code. So this is sort of the equivalent of an and, so find me restaurants whose cuisine is Italian in this particular zip code and I found this non Fuipo restaurant. Let me find all of them. There, I found a bunch of them. All right, so that's sort of the basics. I just wanted to kind of show you the getting started bit of Mongo before I go into the MapReduce component, but there's a lot of information on their website, on, on the MongoDB w w website, that's fairly easy and understandable and shows you a lot more, like how to do, I just showed you and, but there's how to do or, how to do greater than, less than, all sorts of things that are fairly straightforward, so have a look there. Now I want to kind of go into the MapReduce part of the talk here. Let me bring up <coughs> some slides first. All right, and uh, there, I wanted to talk about really working with big data and how we can do this with these distributed data sets. So here, not so big, I have, you can get the, download this Wikipedia traffic statistics. So 16 months of hourly page view statistics for all articles in Wikipedia. And as you can see, it's about 800 gigabytes. So if we wanted to do some analysis of that 800 gigabytes, not huge, but not small either. So we can just buy a simple terabyte drive here. I don't know, maybe that's 50 bucks, maybe even less to store this information on. So that's not a big deal. But then what? So how do we actually write a program that can analyze these statistics? Well, a computer can read about 50 megabytes a second from a, a disk, one of these hard disks. So just reading the data would take five hours to do. So if we wrote a program that read through it and did some analysis, minimally it would take five hours. So we could spend a bit more money, 10 times more money than that um, hard drive, that spinning hard drive, and get an SSD. That's uh, maybe five, eight, maybe 10 times faster. But still, that would be maybe an hour's worth of processing. So if we're doing something where people are waiting, like if a website where you know people connect to the website and we wanted to run some analysis, people aren't going to wait around for five hours for a result. So that seems to be kind of out of the picture. 
And this is really a pretty tiny problem, this 800 gigabytes versus you know, other data sets that are out there. So if we were to look at all the web pages in the world, there's about 20 billion web pages, and this is a super conservative estimate here, this 20 uh, K kilobytes per page. But even with that conservative thing, it'd be 400 terabytes of data. That's just to store it, not to do any analysis of it or any of these interim results. That's just mere storage of these web pages. So let's say I hired you to give me a word frequency account on this collection. So I want to know, you know, what percentage of the words in this document are the, what percent are the word poodle, and so on. So you think, well, that's pretty easy. I mean, you, you, if you took 110, you could do that. So, or 230. So, you know, it's a fairly straightforward, very intro sort of program. And the problem is just the time taken. So that 400 terabytes of data, one computer can read at this rate. So it would take three months to read the web to, or read if we stored it on machines of that size. It would take really a long time to do your kind of 110 method. So let's say we have one of these guys. Sun is out of business, I know, but I just kind of like the looks of these, so I'm keeping the pictures. Inside is a cluster of 500 computers, really sweet. Uh, 4,500 terabytes, or that's 4.5 petabytes. Eight racks of 64 quad-core servers. So really kind of a lot of stuff packed in that little box, and we can move it really anywhere. And we can store the whole web on it. Here's the Internet Archive, their box. And you can see there's some connections. We only need network connections, a chilled water supply because it gets pretty warm in that little box, so we need something to cool it down, and electricity. So that's all we need. We can move these boxes anywhere. So let's say I buy you one, stick it there in Trinkle or in your backyard somewhere. Well, now what? Now what do we do to analyze this information on the web to get this nice word count? So the situation is that you're a graduate of UMW, or at least you've taken 110 and 220 and 230, and you know all there is to know about how to write programs to do word frequency counts. So I hire you to write a program to analyze the contents of the web. Give me these word frequency accounts. How many occurrences of Poodle are there on the web? I want to know. And, you know, the old school way or the way you've been learning so far, three months. And I'm saying, hey, you know, that's really not going to work. I need the answer sooner than three months from now. So I buy you this server, this nice container, put it in your backyard so you can sit out there and work, do good work. And then that question is, well, how do you program it? How do we go from... 110, 220, whatever thinking to something more modern, some way of processing this large amount of data. So we really have to rethink how we're going to write these programs. That's really the problem we're seeing, that we have this, we've learned how to program before, now we get lots of data, and oh my god, I can't wait three months to do something, I need to figure out a way to do it quicker. So here's um, the problem graphically. We're going to use this approach called map reduce. It's way cool. It's used throughout this world of NoSQL. Hadoop, real famous for it. And so we have this idea of a problem. We're going to divide up the problem. This is called the map step. And let me just kind of uh, give you an example here. Um, so we're in the word frequency count. So let's say all these cluster people the cl the machines in a cluster are really people in our class so i divide up a bunch of documents to the people in the class this map step would be this so we've kind of chopped up each document into the words in the document and now i'm telling people hey you know i'm going to the key is what the word is so the thes the us so i'm just going to say we're going to have those um the key of everything the way we're going to group stuff is by the actual word itself. This reduced, so these here then are going to be the individual words, imagine, among all the people in the class, all on our little desks. We have slews and slews of tiny, tiny pieces of paper all cut up, so there's individual words on each piece of paper. This reduced step is that each person in the class is going to group the thes together and count them and the words poodle and count them. So at the end of the one phase of this reduced step, maybe, is that the people have, each person 
has a little list of all the counts of the words. And we might further reduce it so the people in a team might gather their little documents here of how many counts there were and add them all up. So we're going to get a count of all the documents that all the people in that team did. And we might reduce it yet again to get the total count for the class. And maybe there's other classes. All of HCC have been counting documents here, so we get our results from our class run down. So this reduce step may run multiple times. We, each person reduces it by counting. Each team will reduce it. So we reduce, 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 reduce until we get one final solution. So that's sort of the layout of MapReduce. We'll see it in a finer way shortly. So this is sort of what I just said, that we're going to split the line into words. We're going to map by just saying individual words here in the text. And let's say each one has a count of one initially because they're all separate. And we're going to reduce based on each word. We're just going to count them. OK, um, let's continue with MapReduce here. Uh, so let me load in some SQL, so just so we get started with something familiar. And um, let me do a ls here just so I know what I'm doing. Let me, I'll just change directory to temp. All right, and I'm going to load GeoCities SQL. OK, so let me go into PSQL here. Sweet, and all right. And it was GeoCities.SQL. All right, and let me describe cities here. Okay, so I have a city ID, uh, the country ID, I have latitude and longitude, time zone, uh, things along those lines. And what I want to do is this. I want to find the cities within a country that are the closest together. So for each country, I want to find the closest pair of cities, if that makes sense. And I want to use... I'll assume the world is flat, so I'll use Euclidean distance. And uh, just in case people don't remember what Euclidean distance is, let me bring it up here. So let's say, let me get my pen. There we go. So let's say I have a city up here somewhere, and that's at location uh, 1, 4, right there. I don't know if that's right. One, two, three. I kind of miscalculated, but oh well. And then I have a city. I'm just estimating here anyway. And then here I have one at five, one. So there's kind of the distance. I want to find out this length of this diagonal. And if you remember how to do that, it's fairly simple. So it's one minus five, sorry, which is this and this squared plus. 4 minus 1 squared, and take that square root, right? So that's 4 squared plus 3 squared square root, 16 plus 9 equals 25. So the square root of 25, 5. So that's kind of the approach I want to use with this city database, with lat latitude and longitude. All right. Let's give it a shot. So I loaded that in, and let me show you uh, how I think I'll approach this. And that's in temp here. I've created this query ahead of time just because I had to think about it a bit. So I'm going to create a view. Uh, so I'm going to, it's not the, it's sort of like the equivalent of creating a temporary table, not quite. You'll see the difference in a bit. Um, so I'm creating this view, and here's the select statement. So what I'm doing first is for each pair of cities in the database, I'm figuring out the distance. So I'm going to have the country ID, the IDs of the cities, and then I'm going to compute this um, distance. So that's my goal. Then the next thing I'll do after I get that is um, comp then figure out what's the closest one in each state or in each country sorry all right so let me um actually let me save this as something else here give me just a second call that query one 
I'll do this kind of one at a time. Let me go back to query here and do this. And get rid of this one. All right, so I have two queries. Let me save it. One, I'm going to create the, the view, and one, I'm going to actually execute it. So let's um, do that. I'm in Postgres. Uh, SQL, query one, SQL. All right, so the view is created. The, you would think, wow, that's pretty fast with computing the square root, but really the view doesn't actually do any of that computation. It just remembers that when I need to construct that table, here's how I do it. It doesn't actually go and construct the table because otherwise we, it spent, we'd be spending a lot of time waiting for that to finish. And just for uh, our aid, I'm creating, I'm grabbing the stopwatch uh, window. Let me do some moving around here. All right, and what I'm going to do is uh, load SQL2 here and start the stopwatch just so we see how long this is going to take. This is running on Cloud9, uh, so maybe not the super fastest, but we'll give it a shot. So the query's up here. I'm executing it down there. And there we go. And we'll just see how long this takes. It shouldn't take too long, you'd think. All right, and finally we get an answer here. Yeah, what was it? Three minutes and 48 seconds. And there we go. So this Kabul and Mazari Sharif are the two closest cities in this country. Tehran and Corse, the two closest cities in this country, and so on. And that took us a whopping three minutes and I forget what it was, 40 some seconds. Let's see if we can do better with MapReduce and let's kind of review the basic um, framework that we use to solve this problem. So the SQL approach, how we handled it was first we did in step one here, computation. We computed the distance among, uh, between all these cities. So that was that. And step two then was when we did the grouping to find th the closest ones in the countries. So that was the SQL. MapReduce has a really different idea of how to solve problems. The first step we is this map. As the name suggests, the second step is reduce. The third step, an optional step, is this one called finalize. So this map step
we're going to group or divide the data into sets based on some desired value, which we're going to call the key. And it's actually quite similar to this step up here, this grouping step. And uh, let me switch to a terminal here and, and show you that. Um, the function map looks a little bit like this. So it's not going to return anything here. Oops. <laughs> and it doesn't take any arguments. So it looks kind of weird that we're not really returning anything and it's not taking any arguments. But let's explore this a bit more. Even though it doesn't take any arguments, it gets evoked, this map function gets evoked on every document in the collection. And since it's evoked as a method, it has access to this this uh, reference. And with this, you can access really any component of the document. And something else this does is emit. So it emits things. This emit function takes two arguments. One is the key you're emitting on, the thing you're trying to group by. And the second argument is what you want to group. Let me be more clear here, and let me just type here. So when we write a map function, there's three important things. Let me just write that here, rather than do it in that art program. One is, what do we want to divide by? So this is the key we're calling it. The second is what part of the data. So we're only going to grab parts of the data that we actually need to solve the problem. So this is of all the stuff, all the information in a document, what is it that we really need to solve the problem? So, and the third part is really a continuation of two here is what structure do we need to, that data in that the data that we do need maybe it needs to be in a particular uh, structure so let's see if we can answer these questions what do we want to divide or group the data by and what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the closest cities in each country and i hope you're thinking well in this way what we want to do group or divide the data by is by country so we want to emit here in our top function the country ID. So that's the key. So when we're doing all this grouping, let me do that here. And we have a bunch of documents. We're going to take some of those. These are from Canada, let's say. And here's some from Mexico. So we're grouping, collecting these documents, sticking them into groups based on this country ID. So that's this map step we're trying to do. And let's take a look at um, the structure here right quick. So we have. Um, and let me bring that window up. Let me get focus here. And let's describe, it's a very, oh, I have it up here. So here's what our city looks like. And we just need to know, well, what do we need when we group by? Well, we need this, the country ID, that's the key. We need, uh, well, either the city ID and city, but merely let's just keep the city name here. So we need the city. That's one thing we need. And we need the latitude and longitude. We don't need time zone. I don't know what DMAID is or code, you know, but that's minimally what we need. So we need this is the key we're using. And then the information, we'd like the name of the city, certainly, and the latitude and longitude. So that answers that question of what information do we need? So we need, so the first argument to admit was our key. The second is what we need 
the information we need to emit, and that is, uh, let's call it city here. We need, let's just call it latitude, or lat rather. See, I don't have very clever names here. All right, I think that's all we really need. So that answers this second question. What part of the data do we need? Now, the third question. What structure do we need the data in? And the thing to realize when we figure this is that eventually we're going to be reducing this data. So, for example, uh, let me get my art program back up. Okay, so I'm going to explain it this way. So what this map step does is create a bunch of index cards. Let me get my cursor here if I can get it. And um, so imagine that we're all each of us are sitting by a big table and these uh, index we create these index cards with the map step. We have a bunch of these index cards sitting on our big table. So I have a bunch of cards, you have a bunch of cards. And what the reduce step is going to do is we're going to start stacking those cards based on this country ID over here. So I'm going to create a stack of cards for country ID 5 because remember that was the key we were using. I'm going to create a stack of cards here for 271 and 12 and so on. So I'm going to stack these up. And you're going to do the same. Here's your, your stacks and eventually what's going to happen is we're going to combine them. So we're going to take my stack of fives and your stack for country code five and combine them into one big stack here. And same with 271s. So a bunch of people are going to get together and call reduce again. So this is a reduce step. And so is this where we're taking these stacks and combining them. And someone might be a little bit late to the game and start with just their own little index cards laying flat, not stacked up, and we might hand them some stacks to kind of inter... So here they're grabbing an index card that's 12, and I'm giving them a stack of 12. So there's a reduce step here that some of these are directly from map, and other, other of these are the output of reduce. So the problem is, is that whatever we require the input to reduce to be, it has to match the output. And the output is going to be a stack of cards. And if that's my metaphor, the stack of cards. And if we think, well, what data structure are we going to use for this set of cards? We would think, well, that seems to be a list structure. So the output will be something along these lines, that here we have this key, this country ID 5. And what we're actually producing is going to be a list. Each element in the list has that information, right? So we have one element here that has city, latitude, longitude, another city there. So just this list of cities that are in this country ID 5. And we're going to use that for future reduce steps. So that's why we need the input of reduce to be identical to the output of reduce. So here this was my not quite exact input or the, the output of the map function and I want that to match here, so I need to create, make these into a list, a list of one. Why are we doing that? Because the input of reduce needs to be identical, the structure of the input of reduce needs to be identical to the structure of the output. All right, so let's go back to our code here. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to, so I'm going to emit something. I'm going to call it data here. And that's going to be a list. And that list consists of what I formerly had here. So let me kind of do some cutting and pasting to make it look reasonable. Okay, I'm 
almost done here. So that matches that, that matches this closed brace here, and that's this admit. So that's our map function. And the reduce function, as I mentioned, is going to start collecting these individual things into creating these stacks related to the key. The key is the country code. So let me show you that code. These names are not, they can be named whatever. This does take arguments. It contains a key and some values. And I'm going to keep uh, track of the output I'm doing here. It's going to return this uh, collection of what I'm calling cards, this collection of these objects. And now I'm going to kind of iterate through that, the cards it received, and combine them. So I'm getting the values of each. Okay, so that's just taking all these decks I'm receiving in an input and creating one large deck for each key value. So that's the reduce code. So now we have the map code, the reduce code. The only thing remaining is the finalized code. And finalize, the general idea of finalize, if there's any transformation we need to make of the final output of reduce. And uh, let me just show you that code. So that code is going to um, go through this list. Each key now uh, is the country. And in the country, we have these cities. So it's going to find the closest two cities. So instead of me typing each line by line, I'll just show you the final result. So let me do that now. Maybe. Okay, that's in temp here. So here's our map function that I typed in. Hopefully it's identical. Here's the reduced code. Here's the finalized. So it uh, does this first this check. If there's only one city in the country, I can't, can't find the two closest cities. So I just say this country only has one city. And here I do what you've probably done in a 110 class, which is an algorithm to find the closest two cities or closest, the, the smallest of anything really. So I set the min distance to some large amount. I grab the cities here to be, or the two closest cities are nothing. Those, And then when I find a closer pair that's closer than this amount, I'll replace those. All right, so I go through this loop for each city in this country and an inner one for each city in the country. I grab and find the distance. If it's smaller than the minimum distance, I update the results. So that's what I do. And here I call this on this. I give it the map function, the reduce function. I don't include um, the code for the United States because most of the cities are in the United States. It would just create uh, slow things down so I'm, let's say I'm not interested in that and it's the same thing I did in the um, SQL one and finally I run the 
finalized method. Okay, so let's give this a shot. So I have a, the first thing I need to do is actually load that um, database and collection. And that I have in a zip file that you can download. It's called uh, geoworld.zip. So let me do that. Let me just make sure I have it here. I'm going to unzip that. And that creates this dump directory um, with this G all the GeoWorld information in it. And there's a very simple command in Mongo if the data is in that format of the dump directory, and that's Mongo Restore. So Mongo Restore will look for something, a uh, directory called dump, and then load it into Mongo. So uh, that's what I'm going to do. All right, and now I have that map reduce.javascript. That's in my temp folder. I'm just going to change that into directory and go into Mongo. And let me. So now I'm in Mongo. Let's just take, whoops, let me. So I have that GeoWorld database. I'm going to use that database. And now I'm going to load that JavaScript file. That JavaScript file again had the map, the reduce, and finalize methods. And before I do that, before I hit return here, I'm going to get my little stopwatch thing running. So I'm going to hit return here and then quickly move to my stopwatch. Let's see if I can do this in some interesting way here. <laughs> Alright, I think I'm ready. Let me move this. I'll move that over in a in a second. Alright, here we go. And oop. the time we're trying to beat is I think three minutes. And we got the results in 24 seconds, and that's pretty uh, substantial difference. And that's just running on a single computer. MapReduce is really designed to working uh, on multiple machines in a cluster, something our previous method really wouldn't be good at. So it would be lightning fast if that were the case, that we had this distributed or sharded across multiple machines in that cluster. So let's take a look at some of these results. Let me move up here. I guess it, that might be it before it got kind of cut off, but we have one country here, country 132, that only has one city, and uh, that does not look good that this, oh no, the, apparently there's two cities that have the same name that have some distance apart, so there's some little kludginess in our database here, but here we have uh, Kuwait and El Shark are the two closest cities, Let's take a look down and see if we recognize any countries here. Cancun and Puerto Juarez. So it looks like, and here's this interesting city of, um, this country apparently doesn't have um, any cities in it. But we have our results. So that's kind of cool. So that's it. Um, let me just summarize this a tad. So we created a map step and that's really saying, what are we grouping by? The key, what's the key here? That's what we're emitting. And all the things available to us have this this attribute, right? So it's this dot country ID or this dot city. Those are all things that are in this Mongo database. And the stuff that we need to solve this problem are the following. That's this, what we did here that we needed the name of the city be pretty meaningless without the name and we needed the latitude and longitude we decided that this needed to match um, what reduce was producing so this is really the information but we decided to put it into this list or array function and have it this thing called data the reduce function just takes those if it's imagine all these cards on distributed on, um, on a table it's the thing that's grouping these or combining them and uh, that's what this does it just goes through and loops things together groups them by this ID the finalized method looks the most complex but really it's the most similar to other things we've done 
it just finds the two close it computes the distance between two cities and see if this again this it runs on this key so in within a country it'll find that information so i hope that helps explain a little bit about what map reduces it's kind of a cool technology and certainly in, once you start getting used to the examples like this it becomes easier to write these programs that work on multiple machines across extremely large data sets so what we're doing is kind of trivial at least it demonstrates things a little bit just running on one machine but really the power is running on multiple machines. I hope that helps. Have a great day. Take care.